on the board for the Illinois Forestry Association, and I have the pleasure of introducing your speaker this afternoon. Debbie Flegel is a field coordinator and program manager with Trees Forever, where she's managed the Illinois Buffer Partnership Program, the Illinois Community Forestry Program, and the Pollinator Habitat Conservation Program in both Iowa and Illinois. Debbie received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maine in biology with marine, uh, concentration in marine life. Debbie formerly worked for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources as an EcoWatch Regional Coordinator, training adults and high school students to collect biological data on streams, forests, and prairies throughout Illinois. She is a certified arborist and also tree risk assessment qualified certified as well. A project learning tree facilitator and a river watch trainer. So Debbie does lots of things and she's an expert in a lot of things and we really are delighted to have her as our speaker today. I would ask if you have any questions to have you put those questions in the chat box where if you scroll your, your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little gray uh, and sometimes red uh, speaker box there. It says chat below it. You can record your comments, your questions in the chat. And then at the end of Debbie's presentation, we'll take those questions up and ask Debbie to answer them for us. So in the meantime, I'm going to turn the time over to Debbie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. As Lydia said, my name is Debbie Flegel, and I'm a field coordinator and program manager with Trees Forever and a proud member of IFA. Um, so today I'm going to talk about trees and natural disasters, um, how to mitigate storm damage. So I just want you to take a look at this uh, cover photo. This photo is actually taken um, during the most recent during the derecho on August 10th. This is in Cedar Rapids. This is the southwest side of Cedar Rapids. And uh, the home you're looking at is actually occupied by a, um, an, a couple in their 80s. And they, when they built their house, um, this was nothing more than a cornfield. And they had planted all of the trees on their property. And they have lived there for nearly 50 years. So I'm going to show you a, a picture at the end of what their house looked like what the after the derecho. I'm going to turn off my video here. So for those of you who are not familiar with Trees Forever, uh, Trees Forever is a nonprofit organization in Iowa and Illinois. Our mission is to plant and care for trees in the environment by empowering people, building community, and promoting stewardship. We've been around for 30 years. Uh, we have a staff right now of about 20 people between Iowa and Illinois. Um, our headquarters are in Marion, Iowa. And since Trees Forever started, um, we've planted just about three and a half million trees between Iowa and Illinois. We have some national projects and national recognition, and we are a membership-based organization. On average, annually, we work with about 200 or more communities and landowners across both Iowa and Illinois. We engage an average of about 7,000 volunteers, and we provide over $650,000 in grants and technical assistance throughout both states. So today, we're going to talk about trees and natural disasters. Um, here are what we're going to talk about. We're going to cover some benefits of trees in our urban and community forests, um, some weather related natural disasters, some non weather related natural disasters, preparedness. How can you prepare for a natural disaster with your trees? And then some response and readiness. As Lydia mentioned, um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll take care of those at the end. So first of all, why do we plant trees? Energy savings, wildlife and pollinator habitat, stormwater management, improved air quality, um, sequester carbon, beautify our communities where we live, work, and play, and many, many more reasons. Trees conserve energy. Tr shade from our urban trees uh, helps cool our buildings and keeps our pavement cool. And it can increase the lifespan of our pavement by up to 60%. Shade trees help our homes um, with our energy costs. So by planting either a windbreak on the north and west sides of your home to block that northwest wind, or planting trees on the east and 
West sides to help shade from that hot summer sun, it can he help you save up 25 to 30% in your cooling costs. Even in our urban environments, trees provide food and shelter for our wildlife, birds, pollinators. Among the many species that rely on our trees, particularly in our urban areas, are pollinators. And pollinators are responsible for over pollinating over 75% of the world's plants. Pollinators are responsible for more than 35% of our agricultural crops. 3,500 native bee species increase our crop yields. But in the last 20 years or so, there's been a dramatic decline in the overall health and population of, of pollinators, particularly 90% decline in the population of monarchs. Urban trees also help with stormwater management. They intercept the rainfall on the leaves and the bark, store that water. Um, water is up take in the roots and it helps bind the soil. It helps prevent flooding. A large tree can absorb 57,000 gallons of rainwater in a 10 to 12 inch rainfall event. Now this is looking at some different types of, of trees commonly found in our um, communities, crab apple, red maple, bur oak. So we have a small tree, medium sized tree and a large tree. The blue boxes represent how many annual gallons of rain are intercepted by a 10 inch tree. The purple boxes represent over the lifetime of a large of a tree, um, the annual gallons that are intercepted by a mature tree. So it could be, um, you know, a bur oak, we could have a, a 50 or 60 inch diameter bur oak and it's going to capture nearly 5,000 gallons annually. Trees also improve air quality. They take in our carbon dioxide, give off oxygen. They help mitigate the effects of climate change by absorbing and storing carbon dioxide. Trees hold the carbon dioxide in their trunks, branches, leaves, and roots as they grow. And then carbon dioxide is released via the decomposition of dead wood, mulch, and tree care activities. Trees also increase property values. They improve the neighborhood appeal, attracting neighbors and businesses, increasing the tax base in our community. On average, large mature trees on a property can increase the value of your home by about $13,000. Trees are good for our local economies. If we have trees planted in our downtown business districts, they can influence people to make longer and more frequent trips and people are willing to spend more for goods and services. Trees also improve our public health. Um, 2020 has been an odd year for all of us and honestly, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't get outside. I haven't been able to get outside. Um, tree lined streets and trails encourage people to get outside and recreate, whether it's play in the park or go for a walk, take a bike ride. Trees restore us physically, mentally, and emotionally. And hospital patients who can see trees and green spaces from their windows, studies have shown that they tend to heal faster, more than two times faster. They need less pain medication and have fewer complications. And trees are fun. You don't have to be a small child to enjoy getting out and playing among the trees. Whether you're climbing them or sitting under the swing. So using iTree, we can calculate um, how a dollar value for the benefits of our trees. So as trees grow over time, the tree benefits that they provide grow over time. So you'll note that in the left-hand box for energy savings, for one annual, one residential tree, one large tree. So if you have an oak in your yard, 
it's going to provide you um, at year 40, nearly 10,000 uh, KBTU of energy saved. But as over the lifespan of that tree, over 40 years, that tree is gonna provide you more than 50,000 units of energy saved. Same thing with carbon. As the tree matures, it stores more carbon. So the cumulative of for one large tree is close to 8,000 pounds of carbon stored. So as our trees grow over time, so do the benefits that they provide. So when we have storms impacting our communities, we wanna do all we can to save all of our large trees. What types, of nat what types of natural disasters do we have in the Midwest? Ice, wind, flood, drought. Um, before April 10th, I would have lumped derecho and tornado together as just wind. But after seeing the effects of a derecho, they are two completely different types of storms. So the first one is ice damage. It's getting to be that time of year. I noticed in the comments, some of you were already seeing snow today. Um, I'm in central Illinois, so we're just seeing rain today. No snow here. So the accumulation of ice can increase the weight of the branches from 10 to 100 times. Accumulation of ice between a quarter and a half an inch causes small branches and weak limbs to break. Accumulation of a half an inch or more of ice causes larger branches to break, can cause extensive tree damage to a total tree failure. Factors determining the severity of tree damage during an ice storm include the amount and duration of the accumulation of ice, the exposure to the wind, and the duration of the storm. Ability of tree species also play a factor. Trees that have weak branch junctures, decay or dead branches, and included bark or unbalanced crowns. With every one of these storm types that we're going to be talking about, the very first thing I want you to think about safety is the number one priority for every single one of these. I'm not mentioning on, on every slide, but safety is the number one priority. Um, in ice storms, you want to avoid removing ice from the tree. You always want to look up and beware of hanging branches and limbs. If correct pruning needs to be done, you want to do it during the dormant season. And always stay clear of down power lines or limbs entangled in power lines. Make sure you call the power company, call a certified arborist. Do not try to clear up the debris by yourself if it's entangled in power lines. A tornado. So tornadoes are rotating columns of air that touch both the clouds and the ground at the same time. They vary in shape and size, and the length of time on the ground varies. But usually it does damage in a short amount of time. Leaves and branches are stripped off of the trees. Trees are uprooted, twisted, and broken. If the winds are greater than 200 miles per hour, trees can completely be debarked by small pieces of debris. These photos are from the tornado that hit Washington, Illinois in November of 2013. Um, it's actually not too far from where I live. Susceptible trees include those that have included bark, um, weak branching junctures, internal decay, cracks, um, older trees with dead wood, trees that are leaning more than 45 degrees. Other factors include broad or unbalanced crowns, canopy with small twigs, and branches, and fast growing trees, such as some maples, are very susceptible to wind damage. 
One common theme that we've heard from people um, in communities after a tornado is the cost of the, the amount of their utility bill. Prior to a tornado, they've had trees in their yard around their homes. But once after the tornado and all of their trees are gone, um, on average, their utility monthly utility bills go up anywhere from $40 to $60 a month. Some of the more wind resistant species um, include white oak and swamp white oaks, Kentucky coffee trees, ginkgos, catalpa, bald cypress, sweet gum, and serviceberry, among others. So the large picture is from the tornado again in Washington. The small inset is from the tornado in 2018 that was in Taylorville, Illinois. So this was a large, beautiful street tree that has been uprooted by the wind. The derecho is another type of windstorm. And as I mentioned, prior to August 10th, I would have lumped it together with tornado. But it's a derecho is a widespread, long-lived, straight-line wind event that is associated with a fast-moving group of thunderstorms. And it potentially rivals hurricane force winds. So it's similar to having an inland hurricane. On August 10th, the wind speeds in Cedar Rapids were 140 miles per hour for 40 minutes. So it's the equivalent of having a category four hurricane in the Midwest. The amount of tree damage was unbelievable. Um, I just saw a news article this morning that they're estimating the damage from the derecho across Iowa and Illinois is to be about seven and a half billion dollars. Again, safety is a, a number one priority with tornado and derecho damage. Make sure you are wearing your proper uh, personal protection equipment, particularly if you're using a chainsaw. Invariably, the people you see on the news working the chainsaw have um, shorts and flip-flops on, so make sure you're wearing your personal protection equipment. Um, safety is the number one priority. You want to prune your broken and damaged branches if you can. You remove any trees that have lost more than 50% of the canopy and, or sustained damage to more than 30% of the circumference of the trunk. This twisting was a common theme um, throughout uh, the trees of the of Cedar Rapids for the derecho. Another common thing is to make sure you're always looking up. On the inset, there is a, a large broken branch that's actually over someone's driveway and their house. Um, so when you're in a situation like these, Always be aware and safety is your number one priority. Flooding. Unfortunately, with our trees and flooding, it's a wait and see. You have to wait till the waters recede. A tree's recovery after a flooding event depends on number one, what kind of tree it is, what is the species, how long was it underwater, and what was the condition to the tree prior to the flooding. The flooding impacts the root systems first. Immediate impacts include that the tree is inundated with water and sediment deposition um, occurs, limiting the oxygen to the roots. It scours the soil and exposes the roots. And then there's also the physical injury to the tree caused by floating debris. Flood, st flood stress trees may show symptoms um, similar to chlorosis where the leaves turn yellow. They may lose their leaves altogether, defoliation, or they have a reduced leaf size and shoot growth. They may have sprouting, they may have crown dieback, or they may have early fall coloration and leaf 
all of those make trees susceptible to secondary attacks by insects and diseases. So after a flood, you can take a, um, do a soil test for contamination of your soil. And if your soil is not contaminated, you wanna aerate the soil, mulch your tree and water as needed. Prune off any dead or damaged branches and then monitor your trees over several years. So take photos of your trees at least once a year to identify any changes that are, are occurring to see if your tree is recovering or if it is declining further. Drought, again, it's a wait and see type of a disaster. It may take years for your trees to succumb from stress of drought. Signs of drought include wilting, curling, browning of the leaves, premature leaf drop, and dried out needles. Again, long-term drought stresses trees and can make them prime targets for secondary um, attacks by insects and other diseases. How do you mitigate drought effects on your trees? Water, water, water. Water your trees slowly, the equivalent of one inch of rain per week if it doesn't rain, which is about two to three gallons of water per caliper inch of the trunk. Water the trees weekly until the first hard frost. Water your mature trees, not just your newly planted trees. Ideally, we want you to water the large trees that have been standing for a while. Water in the morning and evening to prevent moisture loss due to evaporation and mulch around the trees about two to four inches deep. Avoid extensive pruning during a drought. Do not fertilize. And if you're thinking about doing a planting after a drought, maybe reconsider until the following year. So after you have been through a natural disaster and you have cleaned everything up, do you save your tree or do you remove it? And some factors that you need to think about on whether you try to save your tree or not is what was your, the tree's health prior to the natural disaster? And what is the age of your tree? Is it a young tree um, that, or is it a tree of 40 or 50 year old tree? What species is it? Now, we necessarily would, would, wouldn't wanna save an, an ash that has extensive damage, but we would try to save an oak that has some damage. And due to the benefits that those large trees provide, what is the suitability? Is the tree planted in the right place? What is the potential for future injury? Is the same area, for example, prone to flood again? Or, or do you have trees that are adapted to frequent flooding planted near your house? What is the timing of the disaster? Was it during the growing season or was it when it was dormant? And again, the extent of the damage. More than 50% of the crown has been lost. More than 30% of the circumference of the tree has been damaged or the tree leans more than 45 degrees. This tree is actually in someone's yard in Ottawa. So after on August 10th from the derecho um, in Illinois, there was about 15 tornadoes that spun up. One of those tornadoes hit Ottawa. And so this is a, a tree that um, was recently assessed. And yes, it is slated for removal. This one cannot be saved. I know you're gonna hear about forest health later this week, but some non-weather event disasters. Anytime something affects the entire population of our tree species, that's that's a disaster. Emerald ash borer is a disaster. Asian longhorn beetle, thousand cankers, 
um, spotted lanternfly, even though it's not here yet, when we hope it doesn't get here, but if it does, that could be a disaster for our trees. Um, some others, Dutch elm disease was a disaster. Chestnut blight was a disaster. There's many, many more. So invasive pests and diseases, those are non-weather event disasters that affect our tree population. So how do you prevent against these? Number one, you plant the right tree in the right place. So these folks are planting an oak in a large open space. You do not want to plant the wrong tree in the wrong place. Um, in an urban area in particular, when we plant trees, they're small. So they have plenty of room. That this one, number one, is too close to the corner. It's under the U utility lines, it, so it had to be trimmed by the utility company. It's blocking a, a light pole. Um, lots and lots of issues with this planting right here. So after a disaster, you pretty much are, are starting with a clean slate. This is from the Under the Canopy publication um, that was put out last year, I think, the, the third edition. So this is a great resource. Um, for anyone, it's available. Um, if your community is a Tree City USA community, they should have received those. Uh, Trees Forever has some, Morton Arboretum has some, the Extension offices, the Soil and Water Conservation District offices have them. Um, so you can get these from just about anywhere. If you don't have access to them, um, I can send you some. But have a purpose why you're, why you're planting your trees. Are you planting them for fall color? Are you planting them for shade efficiency? Are you planting them for wildlife? Some things to remember when you're replanting your trees is that large shade trees should be a minimum of 30 feet away from the utility lines. And medium and large trees should be a minimum of 20 to 25 feet away from your building, so away from your house. Small trees should be at least 10 feet away from your house. And if they get only grow up to 20 feet or less, they could be planted under the power lines. Anything taller than that, they have to be moved away. And then you also want to plant trees at least five feet away from your sidewalk so that it, you don't provide any um, safety issues. So thinking about having a plan for when you're going to plant your, your upcoming trees. Also think about what type of trees are you gonna plant? What species are available? What size are you going to plant? Um, some other things to think about is what type of soil do you have? How much sunlight is there? How much space do you have? Are utility lines a factor, the amount of moisture in your region. Are you planting the tree for shade efficiency, for fall color, for spring flowers, for pollinators, for birds? What's your reason for planting this tree? Not just because the big box store down the street is having a sale. Um, and you also want to think about pest resistant and disease resistant species. So now after the Dutch elm disease, there are a variety of elm species that are resistant that would be suitable for planting in your yard. And then what is the characteristic? Um, Does it have unique bark, a unique shape? And then the biggest thing is diversity of species. So if your neighbor has maples in their yard, you do not want to plant any more maples in your yard. Diversify, think outside of the box, um, plant a variety of different species that are going to be able to withstand these types of disasters as well as pests and diseases that are coming down the line. This is the front of the Under the Canopy publication. Um, but once you open that up, it's a nice size poster that has some other opportunities um, and choices of, of tree selection. So if you're not sure what you want to plant, this might provide you with some additional resources. Some other resources for, for choosing um, 
what species to select. We at Trees Forever have our trees and shrubs for pollinators. It's available on our website. Uh, it's a four page document, all native species. Um, and talks about, uh, indicates which pollinators need those trees. Also on our website, if you go to um, treesforever.org forward tree underscore selection, we have some additional resources, including trees for linear sites. If you have overhead power lines or trees for linear sites without overhead power lines, we also have um, a list of trees that provide dense shade, uh, moderate to sparse shade, and then trees for windbreaks. Some other resources, I know Morton Arboretum has a great uh, resource as far as tree selection. So there are many different types of resources out there, but when you're choosing to replant after a disaster, do your research on what type of tree you want to get. Pruning, we're still in the preparedness. How do you prepare for a natural disaster? You prune your trees regularly. You prune out the dead wood. You prune out um, branches that are crossing. You can prune your own trees, but oftentimes our communities, small communities in particular, do not have staff time and the available resources to prune. The, the trees on a regular basis. So that can rely on volunteers to help do that. So things to think about when you're pruning is you want to prune for structure. You want to be able to, to follow a central leader from the base of the ground all the way to the top of the tree. You want to prune off any branches that are dead, diseased, or damaged. You want to prune off any sprouts and suckers that are coming up from the base and prune off any crossing or rubbing branches. You never want to prune off more than 30% of your tree in one year, and you never want to prune the first year you plant the tree. You want it to have at least a growing season in between. When you do that, it makes your trees more resilient to withstand the different types of disasters. So this is just a, a example of what a tree looks like if you'd never prune it, and what one looks like if you do prune it, and which one do you think is gonna be more resilient during the next ice storm that we have? It's not gonna be the one on the top. So um, we've I've actually talked to several city arborists, you know, who, they have a regular pruning cycle of their trees and they have decreased the amount of storm debris that they have just during a regular um, wind storm, not a disaster of a tornado or derecho, but just during a, a normal thunderstorm, the amount of uh, tree debris that they have has greatly decreased because they have their trees on a regular pruning cycle. Response and readiness. Contact a licensed certified arborist. You can go to the Illinois Arborist Association and find an arborist. Um, type in your zip code and they'll pop up a list of arborists who are near you. You can contact them to have them come out and take a look at your trees if you have any concerns. After a disaster, beware of scammers. Um, most recently, after the um, tornado in Taylorville, in December of 2018. That tornado hit at 5.30 p.m. At 1 a.m. there were people with chainsaws knocking on doors asking people wanting to cut down people's trees. Okay, make sure you're aware of scammers. Once you have removed enough of the debris that it's uh, safe, or so that you are able to get out of your home during a disaster, contact an arborist to look at your trees. Don't take any just um, random person who shows up at your house in the middle of the night with a chainsaw. In Illinois, we have the Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team. 
which is a group of specially trained arborists and foresters who volunteer their time to help communities impacted by natural disasters. This is the group that went to Ottawa on October 1st, just a couple weeks ago. They, they conduct rapid tree assessments on public street trees and certain privately owned trees in the community that'll pose a threat to people or public property. The strike team is a collaboration of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, the US Forest Service and Trees Forever. It was modeled after the response effort of the US Forest Service after Hurricane Katrina. When asked why all of these arborists volunteer their time, they said it's an opportunity to give back to communities who may not have the resources they do. And they want to help save trees as much as possible. As mentioned earlier, we're losing our canopy cover at an alarming rate, whether it's due to storms, insects, diseases. Um, and so by having the strike team come in, they can determine whether or not a tree just needs some corrective pruning for the next several years or whether or not it actually needs to come down. Each deployment is different based on the needs of the community. The arborists are identifying the species, taking the diameter breast height, and determining whether or not the tree can be saved or whether it needs to be removed. Um, one story is that recently, when they were in when we were in Ottawa on October 1st, they went and looked at a red oak. The homeowner came out. Oftentimes, when the strike team is in town, um, homeowners come out to see what you're doing to their trees. And the homeowner came out and talked to the arborists and said that he had had three different tree care companies come by to look at the tree. And all three of them said it needed to come down. This was a large red oak. Um, and the arborist said, you don't need to take down that tree. You can save two to $3,000 and just do corrective pruning. So by having the arborists look at the tree, they're able to save that red oak, do some corrective pruning over the next several years and, and reap the benefits of that tree in the community. So I just wanna point out a few things on our Trees Forever website. We have a um, fact sheet basically on all of these different types of storms. Um, on each one of these, it talks about the types of trees that are most resilient to withstand the type of storm. Um, these are all you can download for free. We also have a brochure on the Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team. If your community is impacted by a natural disaster, we hope it's not, um, but at one point, another community is going to get hit. Know that the Urban Forest Strike Team is available to come to your community and help assess the trees. Um, and there's information you need to contact the IDNR, contact uh, Mike Brunk, who is the Illinois Urban and Community Forestry State Coordinator. Now I mentioned at the beginning, I would show you another picture of that home. On the on the front slide, here it is. This is what it looked like after the storm. Um, those homeowners, they had to be literally cut out of their house. Uh, they had three large trees land on their roof, so they couldn't get out the doors. Um, the side wall of their house buckled. They lost nine trees out of their yard. And then the day that I was there, they had me come and look at a few other trees that were still standing in the back. And um, unfortunately, they were going to lose a couple more because of the severity of the damage of those trees that were still standing. So pre be prepared for a natural disaster. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. As I mentioned, we hope that none of you ever are impacted by a disaster, but 
at some point, uh, the odds are that one of us will be. So safety is the number one priority. Um, and then, you know, contact the certified arborist to come look at your trees. And if, if all else fails, um, that you can't get anyone, contact the um, Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team and they can come to your community, have your mayor contact us. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and take any questions. Thank you, Debbie. I see three questions um, in our chat box. If you have other questions, please feel free to add those in as we um, continue to answer these questions. Um, the first question is, uh, would you be able to define what a pound of carbon means in layman's terms? Oh, well, Lydia, you might need to help me on this one. Well, actually, I, I looked it up because I thought I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> So it actually is a physical measure of carbon and there are other ways to measure it as well. It's the internet says it, it's the same as 454 grams of CO2 gas or 64 US gallons or 8.566 cubic feet. So it's a measurement of the actual carbon. So there you go. Thankfully, I was able to look that up while you were I'm glad you, I'm glad you were able to look that up. <laughs> So the next question is explaining a little bit more or to, to reconfirm the difference between a derecho and a tornado. And their comment is they understand that one is longer period of time and more surface area impacted versus quicker and smaller area. Could you just uh, confirm that? That, that, is, that is correct. So um, yes, the, the tornado generally has the defined pathway um, and it could be and it varies from uh, in shape and size. But yes, the um, derecho is a long line of widespread thunderstorms um, with severe winds. Um, it's more widespread. So yes, the, uh, the comment was correct. Thank you. And then there was a comment that was made, which I think could really result in a question, which I may make here just to get you to talk a little bit about it is that um, the, the writer has said that erosion along waterways can cause trees to be uprooted and end up falling into the waterways, causing the waterways to change direction um, and flow, causing erosion in other locations and flooding. I'm assuming with some of these really extreme uh, rain events that we see quick and flashy responses to these waterways that could be impacted by fallen trees. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, absolutely. With the, the increase, um, in the amount of um, impervious area, um, our streams, our urban streams are much more flashy during a rain event, where in previous years, maybe we had a rain event, the, the stream level may have, have risen a couple inches, but now we're seeing it rise a couple feet. It's very flashy, um, but then within a few hours, it's back down. Um, and so that extreme flashiness does cause a lot of erosion. And so the, the, the trees along the stream, the soil is getting washed away and the tree roots are exposed. And eventually those trees become, become unstable and they will fall into the, the creek too. And it, it does, it can cause even more uh, flooding if it uh, backs up, um, causing like a dam. Um, but yes, it does, it does uh, with the the flash flooding of of streams in our communities and even in our rural areas as well. Um, more and more water is being diverted quickly, and so we're having a less um, there's less time for that water to get absorbed and and regenerate the groundwater. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we have another question here about uh, if you could talk a little bit about storm damage to natural forests or forest areas. Are there present preventative practices that you can uh, recommend that would lessen potential damage from future storms? I, I would have to say doing the same thing, pruning out the deadwood as much as possible. Um, we did see, I, I've seen some devastating um, some natural areas and, and after a derecho, the derecho, they it just looks like toothpick standing. There's not 
there's not much left. I mean, it's it's devastating and, and heart wrenching. Um, but but do what you can is to you know make sure you're taking care of your trees, make sure you're you're pruning out the dead wood as much as possible. Um, the the steps that I mentioned earlier they would they would um, work for a natural area as, not only in a, a community setting but they would work for a natural area as well. Um, you know if you need to do selective um, timber stand improvement things like that would would help as well. So do what you can to um, I know in southern Illinois they've had some straight line wind events. And then after that, uh, those wind events, then the invasives come in. Um, so doing what you can to to prevent the invasives, as well as pruning out the deadwood as much as you can. Thank you, Debbie. Any other questions, or does anybody want to comment about uh, some of the comments that have been made or questions that have been made? You feel free to put some comments in. Uh, track are in the chat box and we'll be glad to read those out for you if you'd like. All right, I'm not seeing anything. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was very uh, informative and interesting and certainly is going to become, uh, uh, it seems to be becoming more, more common practice or commonplace to see these big storm events come through. So is something that we uh, all need to be aware of. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And yes, it, it, it is becoming more and more frequent, unfortunately. Um, so we need to do what, what we can to, to make sure we're keeping our, our tree canopy as much as we can.